Hello, everyone. And welcome to our event, a conversation with Mr. Gado Pailan, the well-known politician from the Republic of Turkey and one of his country's leading democracy and minority rights activists. This evening, Mr. Pailan will provide insights for us on Armenian rebirth, the last plight, an important subject at this critical juncture in the long and poignant history of the Armenian people and nation. My name is Professor Anne Karagosian, and it is my privilege as the director of the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute to welcome Mr. Pylon, uh, as well to UCLA, to welcome all of you to UCLA, those of you here in person, as well as those watching on Zoom and on YouTube. Those of us in the Promise Armenian Institute, as well as our co-coordinators, the Center for Truth and Justice, are honored that you have taken the time from your busy lives to join us this evening. I'd also like to thank the co-sponsors of this event, the Promise Institute for Human Rights at the UCLA Law School, the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy, the UCLA Armenian Students Association, and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, or Nasser. We are grateful for the support of all of our co-sponsors. And on behalf of our co-sponsors here at UCLA, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the indigenous Gabrielino Tongva peoples. It is a privilege for our institution to acknowledge the history of the land on which we are established. Before we move on with our program and the introduction, let me mention a few procedural types of matters. First, let me note that this event is being recorded for future viewing on our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute YouTube channel. Second, after our speaker's address and a bit of informal discussion with him, um, you may ask questions, those of you in the audience here in person or on Zoom, those of you in person, please just raise your hand and one of our assistants will come to you with a microphone. Uh, and you can ask your question of Mr. Pylon. Those of you on Zoom will have uh, the opportunity to use the Q&A button on your Zoom window to pose questions. In all cases, please try to be as succinct and clear in your uh, questions as possible. And uh, third, when the presentation and the Q&A session is finished, we invite the in-person audience here to join us in the lobby for refreshments after our event. Now I'd like to welcome to the podium, Ms. Gayana Arajanian, who is a partner in the legal firm of Michael Sullivan and Associates and is also a board member of our partner, the Center for Truth and Justice. The Center for Truth and Justice is a nonprofit organization comprised of approximately 30 attorneys in the United States, Armenia, and Artsakh that began documenting evidence of war crimes committed by Azerbaijan after the 2020 Artsakh War. The Center for Truth and Justice has trained over 150 young lawyers and law students in Armenia and Artsakh in international law on methods for collecting evidence of war crimes that are admissible in international courts. CT CFTJ has since collected over 500 eyewitness testimonies from victims and used these testimonies to provide reports to the UN as well as to the US and international governing bodies. They have also filed complaints at the UN against Azerbaijan on behalf of tortured Armenian pro uh, prisoners of war. So, Guyana, I will now turn the podium over to you for an introduction of our guest speaker. Good evening, everyone. Gara Palian is a leading opposition voice and a human rights defender in Turkey. Mr. Palian has served in the Turkish parliament for eight years, 
from 2015 to June 2023, and is internationally recognized for its struggle for democracy and minority rights in Turkey, as well as its support for peace and Caucasus. Mr. Pailan was among the very few Armenians to be elected in the Turkish parliament and was the first lawmaker, lawmaker to submit, apologize, to submit an amendment for the recognition of the Armenian genocide in Turkey. He continued to highlight the need for Turkey to face his, this historic tragedy throughout the time he served in the parliament, but was legally prosecuted for his amendments and statements. Mr. Pailan has been Pailan has been a vocal critic of discrimination against Turkey's Christian and Jewish minorities and has constantly used his public position to highlight abuses and policies that affected minority communities. Prior to entering parliament, Mr. Pailan served as a coordinator for the Armenian schools in Turkey and is among the founders of the Friends of Hran Ting a group that has sought justice for the 2007 killing of the Armenian genocide and has been organizing commemoration for the Armenian genocide. Garo Pailan, Pailan is widely recognized as one of the Turkey's leading democracy advocates and has been the recipient of several international awards for his work on democracy. Mr. Pailan. Good evening, yakşamlar, merhabalar. Good evening, everyone. Parikisher, shat urachem, or besi handipetsung. The world have entered another dark era, unfortunately. That is what I feel. And that is what we were trying to avoid as human rights activists. But unfortunately, the world have entered another dark era. And what we have just witnessed in Israel is a huge earthquake. And it is going to have huge impacts all over the world. And unfortunately, what I feel is in the coming years or decades, Middle East, Caucasus will not be stable. And this earthquake will have aftershocks all over the region. I hope, I hope everybody you know, behaves, including the United States, and we can really end these vicious cycles as soon as possible. But I don't see that. The world has entered another dark era. 30 years ago, human rights really mattered. But I, I don't see that today, these days, unfortunately. 30 years ago, when Serbians were repressing Bosnians, the world mattered, or other human rights, other human rights violations as well. But these days, everybody cares about interests. Everybody, most of the nations only cares about great power rivalries, and unfortunately, some lives matter more, but some lives doesn't matter. What we have suffered a month ago is another genocide. It is, some people call it ethnic cleansing, I call it a genocide. Because you don't need to kill, you don't need to do mass massacres, no, to just, if it is enough for you, for you to force people to leave their motherland and take them out of that. And but nobody cares about it. I believe if 30,000 penguins were under blockade for nine months, the world would care about them more. But they, the world didn't care about 120,000 Armenians under blockade for more than nine months. This means something. In this world, whatever we do, human rights 
doesn't matter, and Armenians' life didn't matter, unfortunately. Armenians' lives didn't matter. We need to face this. We thought we were Christians, and we were trying to be a democratic country, but these were only nuances, only little nuances for this new world order. The new world order cared about other issues which Azerbaijan had, which Turkey had. Turkey had always had it. Turkey's all human rights violations has been appeased for decades because it has a strategic importance, because it is a NATO country against communist states or now you know, other interests. United States or NATO needs Turkey. That is what they say. We never faced this issue. For more than a century, we thought with our struggle, we could really blame Turkey or for, for, the, for, for this catastrophe, genocide. But unfortunately, Turkey will be appeased for decades more. And what Azerbaijan had, let's say, last 20 years, in last 20 years, they did build leverage due to the new world order. They did build leverage. The leverage was, of course, somehow the energy lines. Let's say in 2008, the Big companies were deciding, oh, we need Azeri oil, even Turkmenistan oil and gas. It should pass through Armenia and Turkey. There was a peace process maybe just because of that, because the Western powers cared about it. They needed oil and gas. And the football diplomacy have started. This is how the world functions. No, we were about to ha have the borders open and normalization process, but unfortunately, we couldn't achieve that. We couldn't achieve that peace, and the pipelines went through Georgia, and Azeris were happy with it, and we didn't have that some kind of a leverage. And Azeris were allies with Turkey after 2015, when Turkey left the democracy, democratic path, uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan deepened the relations, deepened the, you know, uh, that alliance. And Turkey left the democratic path and ended the Kurdish conflict you know, peace process and started to use sophisticated weapons against the Kurds, which we were st trying to convince to stop, but they were not there, there at all. Erdogan had a power struggle with the Gulenists, and he only cares about his power that we know, and he made a coalition with the ultranationalists. And they started to buy sophisticated weapons. Moreover, they produced sophisticated weapons, drones, missile systems, tanks. I don't understand so much about those weapons, but we see when they are used against people, of course. And they shared these weapons to Azerbaijan. They sent these weapons to Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan army was getting stronger. And Azerbaijan was supported by a big country, Turkey. We turned a blind eye on it. Azerbaijan had another leverage. And this was in, not enough. Azerbaijan had, were allies with Israel as well. Nobody knows Israel sends much more weapons to Azerbaijan compared to Turkey. Why? Because that they like Azeris? They hate Armenians? No, it is all about interests. Because uh, Israel has Hezbollah on its border on Le in Lebanon. And 
In return of that, Israel wanted a garrison state on Iran's border, which is Azerbaijan. And they sent all the, the weapons they have. When I saw this, you know, I went to Armenia to try to convince people. The geopolitical balance is changing. There is a, there is a great threat against Armenia. And Turkey is sending weapons, Israel is sending weapons, and energy is getting, becoming more important issue, and Azeris are building leverage. What are we doing? Are we ready for coming threat? This is, this is going to be a threat, because I knew that the weapons which are, has been used against the Kurds is going to be used against Armenians in the coming months or years. Azeris were waiting that day to just to be much more stronger than Armenia. But we turned a blind eye on it. Why? Because, unfortunately, nobody was ready to compromise about anything. Any kind of comp compromise was labeled as treason. And mostly from out of Armenia. Because we, did, we were not thinking about the reality of Armenia. It is, it is a land, it is a country. Of course, we have resentments against Turks. We have resentments against Azeris. Don't the Greek people have resentment against Turks? Yes, they have. Or other nations. Or Israelis like Turks? No, they hate them. Or Turks like Israelis? No, they hate them. United States have relations with so, all the countries. Some of them, they hate each other, but they have relations. But because of our resentments, we just labeled every kind of peace negotiation or peace talk or, uh, let's say, compromises as treason. That is why it was impossible for Armenia to even think about peace. Because any president, any prime minister who would think and sit and talk about this peace deal would be labeled a traitor, Tawajan. Nowadays we hear that word, unfortunately. Because we know nothing about the Armenians' reality, Arsas' reality. I went there, are you ready for this? They said, if they have drones, we have anti-drones. If they have tanks, we have anti-tanks, which we, don't, we didn't have, unfortunately. So, in the international relations, you either need to be strong and or clever. Look at Israel's position. Of course, it is a terrible disaster, but, but Jews have just faced. But look at Israel's position for 75 years. They are repressing, repressing Palestinians. But are they, are they in this position? Do they have the legitimate, legitimacy to do that? I don't think so. But they say we have the power. If somebody hits us, us once, we hit them 100 times like they are doing nowadays. If we were to say, say we will never ever compromise about anything, you need to have that kind of a force. The, this world is not ruled by law. Some of you might think that, oh, there is judiciary, there is law, ma machine, whatever. This world is ruled by law, no. Maybe if you have leverage, you might have some right before a judge. If you have leverage, if you have public interest. No, for nine months, 120,000 people under blockade and Western powers are not even lifting their finger. Only saying concerns, deep concerns. I know the reality in DC, what is going on. Your you know, administration thinks 
We cannot hurt Azerbaijan. That is their question. We cannot. Why? They are allies with Israel. And Israel has the biggest leverage here in DC and United States and the media, which is making the public opinion. So, now, as I thought, if we were strong, of course I would oppose to this position without compromising. You cannot have peace at all. You need to give something, take something, and make peace. That should be our position. Some hardliners might support this position, but we were not strong at all. Second of all, we were not clever enough, unfortunately. We were not ready to face the reality of Arsakh and Armenia. And we unfortunately only said, no way, we will not be compromised. We did this mistake once again, 100 years ago. After we suffered the Armenian genocide in 1915, in 1918, we were about to suffer another genocide. But in Sardarabad, we stood up and fought back. Somehow, we established the first Armenian Republic. And Azeris, at the same day, established the first Azerbaijani state. Then, we started fighted, fighting with Azeris and Turks. And even we started to fight between each other. Communist and nationalist armies started to fight with each other. And who, took, who benefited from this fight? Azeris, Turks, Armenians? No. Russians benefited from this fight. They were happy with it. Maybe they were just planning this. They took everything over. Bolsheviks took our first Armenian state and the first Azerbaijani state as well. Now, we made the same mistake when the Soviet Republic collapsed. Of course, we fought for the rights of security of people of Arsakh. We won the war. But did we win the peace? Did we win any kind of autonomy about Arsakh? No, not at all. Did any country recognize Arsakh after that war, including Armenia? No, they didn't. In 1996, we were able to have the autonomy of Arsakh, the best autonomy in the world, maybe, Arsakh, with the international guarantees. Is there anyone who would object to that today? if we have that for Arsakh, an autonomous Arsakh with international guarantees. I wouldn't object to that. And moreover, Azeris didn't have this kind of ultra-nationalist identity those years. Didn't have. Even didn't have any identity. I don't know. It's a, it was a, some kind of a Shia identity. It was not a nationalist identity. But some hundred thousands of Azeris fled from those lands which we ignored. They went to Baku and other parts of Azerbaijan, and over that, that authoritarian regime benefited from that hatred and created an identity over it, and that identity, with a boomerang effect, waited for years and hit back. And now, unfortunately, Armenians lived the same exodus, unfortunately. So, we did, as I told, we needed to take lesson out of history, and we needed to really secure Arsakh. The most important thing is to keep people somewhere. If your policy is making your, your people suffer, and even live an exodus, and even live in genocide, your policy is totally wrong. If you are, your hardliner position is making your people suffer and lose without leverages, without everything, that policy should be criticized. What we need to focus on now? I believe we always, we are the prisoners of our past and we put 
90% of our energy looking at the past and just dealing with the past. But I would be in favor of this, really. And that is what I did in Turkey, as you know. Always promoting, trying to try to fight for the genocide and all the human rights violations in Turkey, which have happened in the past. But despite that, I believe putting our pressure on the future will help us to find justice in the past. The world is not going to be just at all. This is a dark era. And whoever has the leverage, whoever has the public attention, whoever has the power will find justice in the past and will be, you know, will, will, will be, will leave, will, uh, will have some kind of security in the future. Or else, those countries are going to lose. And Armenia, now, unfortunately, I have a bad news. Now Armenia is at stake, friends. Armenia is at stake. In that region, which produces now earthquakes and fault lines, lines are moving nowadays. In the middle of, the, of a geography, which is full of authoritarian regimes, which have ambitions over Armenian territory about corridors, roads, energy lines, whatever, Armenia is at stake. We need to face this reality. Now, our mission should be this. We shouldn't wait for another catastrophe. We some, most of the times live in this victimhood and nihilism, unfortunately. No, we shouldn't live in this victimhood. We then, another Sardarabad spirit, we need to stand up and unite. But what do we do? What do we do? Now, when a nation is about to face an existential threat, what does that nation do? That nation unites. Most of the nations unite when they see an existential threat. A clever and uh, which cares about who, uh, the, the, that nation and state, a motherland, they unite. Regardless of their ideology, they unite. But unfortunately, I see this, and your Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, sees this in the com coming weeks. Azerbaijan might attack Armenia. We are not united at all, and I don't see any kind of mobilization about this. We need to mobilize about this coming threat. That is what we should do. Second of all, I was there last week in Armenia and met with so many Arsakh refugees. And they, most of them, have lived a huge trauma. And at least half of them don't want to live in Armenia. After 1988 earthquake, I remember there was a mobilization in the nation. That was a, that was a catastrophe as well. And I was 16 years old, and in Istanbul, I was doing my best to help the victims of that earthquake. This, is, was a, this exodus was a great earthquake, but I don't see that mobilization as well. We need to really mobilize our nation to convince all the Arsaf people to stay in Armenia. No, our diaspora can, could be our biggest strength, strength. But now, unfortunately, our diaspora and Armenia relations because it is so unhealthy, it is our biggest weakness. That is what I can say. We should really heal this relationship with the, and coming to the terms, understanding the reality, and thinking about how can I be beneficial to my motherland. But, no, this is a long-term project. This should be a long-term project. But for the short term, we need to really mobilize to avoid the coming threat. Because, believe me, it is going to hurt so much if we see another catastrophe, Azerbaijan attacking Armenia. And it is going to be a Russian plan to end the democratically elected government, 
and to just throw out all the Western institutions and it is going to be the end of the, 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 the uh, Armenia that we dreamt of. And it is going, not going to be, as you know, Azerbaijan has the oil. We have our brains, as you know. Now, nowadays, because of uh, democratic uh, Ar Armenia, that the Armenia is more democratic no nowadays. And it is attracting so many brains nowadays, IT sector and others. Economy is doing well. And it is going to be more strong, stronger in the coming years, I'm sure about it. But Russia is not happy with it. Russia is not happy with a democratic country which is going to be a role model for the other countries in the coming years, which, has, which is trying to have a balanced policy between Russia and the West. Russia is not happy with it. They are doing what they did to Georgia in 2009, and they are trying to get rid of that democratic country. So for this, we shouldn't wait. It is not about the government or the prime minister. We, sh we can have resentments against him. It is so normal. But it, this is the time, it is not about the Mr. Pashinyan, the Armenian government. It is about Armenia. For this, I think we need to unite. And with this sentence, this should be our last catastrophe. Our Sah catastrophe should be our last catastrophe. And if we can Arme make Armenia great, I think in the coming years, we, will, we can find justice in the past. If not, we will either unfortunately lose our future and we will lose our past where we can find justice for. So for now, I want to really make a call on my nation to just stand up and to together do our best to convince Biden administration to do 1% of that don't which he did for Israel. He said, I know other countries want to interfere. Don't do it, he said. And he sent all the Marines to the East Met. You know, some lives, as I said, matter, and some lives matter more. But we need to face our lives don't matter in the United States and other countries. We are sometimes living in echo chambers. We need to face this, and we need to build leverage to change this, because in this world, sufferings, being a Christian, will not matter. Only interests will, will matter. This will be a dark era. In this dark era, to suffer, you need to be strong. We need to be strong and build leverage to support our cause. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your uh, powerful words, um, Garo. We um, invite anyone in the audience to raise their hand, and we have staff that can come around and um, allow you to pose questions. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll start with a couple of uh, questions for you myself, though. You had mentioned that relations now between Armenia and the diaspora are not where they could be perhaps are not uh, in a good place. What would you specifically recommend to bolster those, uh, that relationship? Because there is a great deal of concern clearly by the uh, diaspora about the refugees that have moved into Armenia, and there's a lot of outpouring of support for care for the refugees at the very least. But maybe you could elaborate on some ideas there. Of course. First of all, um we need to really go to Armenia more. Really, really I, I highly recommend this. We need to take some time in Armenia and face the reality of Armenia. There is a really phenomenal uh, youth in Armenia, shining, really, trying to make Armenia strong by all means. And they are doing their best. And you can't believe 
100,000 Arsaf people came to Armenia, and all of them have shelter. All of them have a shelter. All of them had food. The volunteers were wonderful. The youth were wonderful. This is really, this was great. But, you know, a nation like us should have done this. In the first week, we, need, we had to mobilize here, put pressure on Maidan administration to help Armenia more. What did they do? Sent, they sent Mrs. Samantha Powers, and she said, she went to Armenia, and she said, we are going to give you $11 million. What is $11 million in America, United States? I saw my friend having a house which worth known for $11 million, a luxury home it was, in LA. And what happened about Israel? Of course, I'm not, I don't want to compare this, but they suddenly sent $2 billion to Israel right away. You are ta taxpayers as well. You could have put more pressure on Biden administration or your Congress people or senators to do more about it and to help Armenian government to offer each and every Arsa family a house in a year. That is what Erdogan did last year. This year, we had suffered the earthquake. We thought it was the end of Erdogan. In 10 days, what Erdogan did was, don't worry, I'm going to build each and every house which have been demolished. He didn't have money, but he didn't care. He, he just offered it. Now he's searching for money. In return of Sweden uh, no accession process, he's going to get $18 billion from the World Bank, which Biden administration have just said yes. So he has cards, he has leverages, he uses these leverages, and he gives hope to his nation. This is what we should have done. And second of all, a nation just having an existential threat should not be the prisoners of their resentments to each other. Stop blaming each other, first of all. We need to give it a break. Until we just uh, avoid this existential threat, and as I told, we need to go more to Armenia to face the reality because, don't misunderstand me, but they, should, they must have more say about them you now as Armenians who are living in Armenia than us, I believe. And we should be beneficial to, to them. This should be the you know, healthy relationship. Now, we should show them opportunities, how they should help them. That is what we should do. This, is, this, is, this should be a healthy relationship. But if we say like this, if you do this, you are a traitor. This should be so much. No, it, I, as Melissa knows it as well, and so many people here knows it. No, that Word I hate, it is so easily used in Turkey against us. Now, whenever we ask for something, they call you are a traitor, whatever. We should not do that. It, is not, it shouldn't be this easy to call somebody a traitor. Instead, we should just focus on, criticize them to show the right way, to, to just create new policies about a strong Armenia, about Armenians' future, about Armenians' security. That is what we should have done, and that's what we should do, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, are there other questions? Please. Thank you for your coming. Um, so can you elaborate on, the, on your statement about the current status of the diaspora versus Armenia relations? And second, Who's responsible for that change? Is it the Republic of Armenia or is it the diaspora and organizations? No, I guess, of course, Armenia is trying to change. And as you know, in the universe, whichever doesn't change is going to disappear. Change is the reality of the universe. You need to change. You need to adjust your position uh, and just see the opportunities and the threats to exist, that is the rule of the universe. If you don't, 
as you know, um, you break. You need to be really, uh, you need to be able to adjust to the new era. Unfortunately, we are not thinking and behaving with the parameters of the new world of 2023. That is what Armenia is trying to do. No. Um, because Armenia, because of the fear coming from Turkey and Azerbaijan, relied all its security to Russia. 80%, 90% to Russia. They thought Russia is going to help them. Azerbaijan has one more leverage. I forgot about it in my speech. After the Ukraine war, Russia is sanctioned by Europe. And Russia is selling its natural gas and oil over Azerbaijan nowadays. So this is another leverage. This is the coming threat we should have seen. And when you see it, you now Russia and Azerbaijan are becoming allies, you can't trust Russia anymore. You either need to be strong by yourself for the coming threat, or you need to compromise, or you need to find another ally, just like Greece does. You know, whenever Erdogan says, I'm going to take the islands one day, Michotakis comes here, and the US says, don't worry, I, I am just going to build new bases there, and Turks cannot attack you. That is what it is. So Ar Armenia is trying to uh, establish a bal balanced policy. It is a very dangerous game, of course, I can say, because Russia is vulnerable. But Russia's symbol is bear, as you know. Bears are you know, a very dangerous animal, but a wounded bear is even more dangerous. And it is about to really, it, the end game is this. I know because Erdogan and Putin met in Sochi 45 days ago. They decided a scenario, they wrote, it, wrote it a scenario giving Arsakh to Azerbaijan, and in return, Azerbaijan is going to have maximalist demands and attack Armenia and try to establish a corridor which is going to be controlled by the Russians and end the, end the democratic Armenia. This is the plan. If we see this plan, we need to do whatever we can to avoid this. This should be the healthy relationship that I can offer you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? I think we have one right here. Uh, Parev Garov, Parev thank you for uh, being here today. Thank uh, you. I'm a student here at UCLA. I had one quick question for you. Do you believe, given the current circumstances um, with the war and everything that has gone on, will peace with either Turkey or Azerbaijan ever be possible? And if so, what would, we, what would need to happen in order for that to... Yeah, thank you for this question. This is a very important question for me because... Uh, uh, we are so close to peace at the same time, believe me. You know, but you, you are going to say, what is it then? We are so close to war and so close to peace at the same time. There are, because there are peace efforts as well. But I know Azerbaijan. I know Turkey very well. Their ambitions, how they behave. You know, nationalists are mostly coward, really. But when they see somebody vulnerable, they attack on them. But when they see a force, a most more powerful something, a red line, they step back. That is how it is. You know, they always, you know, uh, let's say, shouted at me. If I stood, stepped back, they would come over me more. I didn't because I had rights. I just kept my position there. That is, that is how I somehow uh, found some respect in the Turkish you know, uh, people. So that is what we should do. Now, if, let's say, they see, now they are seeing it, we are just trying to take over, let's say, our prime minister. It is only aim. They see, oh, these are vulnerable. These prime minister. We need to put more pressure on them to take more. But if they see a united nation standing up against them and 
mobilizing to put pressure on US, France, Turkey, other countries to not attack on Armenia and showing them the interests. With peace, we can open that doors, which is going to deliver welfare to Azeris, Armenians, and Turks. That kind of a dream, putting pressure on this. Then Aliyev is going to see, oh, there is, this is pricey. This attack is going to be pricey. And Erdogan is going to see that. If Mr. Biden calls Erdogan, let's say, saying that don't do it, with 1% of the previous thought, don't, he's going to stop. I'm sure about it. I'm sure about it. But as I told you, they have no intention to do it at all. They have no intention to show a red line because the main issue is the Israel's position. So they don't want to hurt Azerbaijan. Then if you have, we have, we have, we have a great you know, community here, not only the Armenians, I mean, we have Turkish and Kurdish and other friends here and American friends here. Together, we can put pressure on this administration to show them a, some kind of a red line. If we show that red, red line, they are going to see, oh, this is what we can get. So sit at the table, just sign, sign the peace deal. It is going to be the very beneficiary, beneficial to Armenia. Most of, first of, it, of all, I, be, I believe in that because we have brains, as I told you, they have oil. In five to 10 years, Oil is going to be less important. But brains are getting more important. There are unicorns in um, Armenia, and economy is booming. It's going to boom more if we have security and peace, and we are going to be stronger in the coming years. That is what we need to concentrate and try to convince other powers to show Erdogan and Aliyev a red line. That is what we should concentrate on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you comment perhaps about um, alliances with other countries besides the United States, besides the United States, potentially drawing a red line? Are there other countries in Europe, for example, France or India in Asia? Um, of course. <clears throat> other countries who can be very helpful to Armenia that we're sh they're yeah. fostering. Uh, yes, of course. Br uh, Brussels is very important, European Union. As you know, after the catastrophe we lived in, uh, 2020, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, European uh, Parliament uh, chair, went to Azerbaijan, signed the peace, uh, signed the energy deal, as you know. If we can convince Europe, let's say European Union, to show them a red line, if you attack Armenia, sovereign Armenia, we are just going to cancel this energy deal. They are not there at all, but I spoke with them. They are not there at all. Concerns deep concerns. That is what they are going to use. So we need to convince them at, as well. We have people in Europe, but I believe Europe doesn't decide the foreign policy. US decides mostly, and Europe follows. If, if Mr. Biden, Biden administration decides that this is the red line we are showing you, uh, Mr. Erdogan, Mr. Aliyev, Europe is going to follow, and they are going to show a red line. So the key is here. This is a, this we can say fortunately that we have an Armenian state, uh, people here, but it is, going, it, is a very, it is going to be very hard for us to convince Biden administration. But we can change the public opinion. Let's say in the 1990s, when Turkey was about to put pressure on Iraqi Kurdistan and demolish everything, some, really believe me, some tens of Kurds struggled in DC to raise awareness about the Kurds in Iraq. And they raised awareness and uh, had relations with the senators, Congress people, and administration. And that way, they saved Iraqi Kurdistan. So some really uh, effort really change, can change US position. It is hard. But we need to try it. If we don't, really, we, we, we are going to put the blame on us. There, your, our grandchildren and so, children are going to ask, what were you doing, mother, father, those days? They are going to ask about it. So we need to 
put all our effort with our profession. I don't know what your professions are, but we need to really uh, mobilize our nation to avoid the coming threat. And we can do it. Believe me, we can do it together. Thank you. Thank you. See, was there another question? Yes. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. We'll go here and then to you next. Thank you very much, Baron Pailan, for being here with us. Thank you. You have all of our respect, and you've earned that respect by being true and brave and strong in the place where it's most difficult to be that as an Armenian. And uh, we all watched, have watched you and um, been proud. I think all of us, more than anything, want to be united. I think all of us here know that our strength is in our unity and that we have endured uh, over the centuries, over millennia, against all odds, not always united, but um, now we need to be united. But the thing is, you say that the Armenians of the diaspora are not united. I feel like the Armenians of the diaspora, just as a part of our whole, have been united. When, when, when not only in the earthquake, but when there was the drive for independence for Armenia, for Artsakh, to defend Artsakh 30 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago, Armenians did come together. And yes, we want to be a part of a whole. And, but who, who, what is that policy? You went there and you said, there are drones, and they said there are anti-drones, but there weren't. You said there are these, and they said there is this, but they weren't. We were told we're doing well in Artsakh, but we weren't. We were told we've had opportunities to build, to grow our military, to grow our, to grow our diplomacy, our relations, our everything. And Behind whom, with whom do we unite? We, reunite, we unite with each other, but there has to be a plan. And there has to be defense, and there has to be identity and unity, and not just caving in. We have to stand up for the truth. The more you compromise, the more they'll come and run over you. And I do believe there has to be give and take, and I do believe there has to be peace. But how do you get to that peace? And how do you stand behind a leadership and behind a country who has been saying one thing, and I know it's not easy, and I don't go bashing them, but I know that we need to build. We need to build together. And we've been shown time and again that that's not happening. Yeah. So how do we do that? Um. No, uh, we are vulnerable. We have to face this, first of all. But, you know, we still have, uh, we can still build leverage. Let's think about this. Uh, what is the sacrosanct word in uh, the world these days? Territorial integrity, isn't it? They are using this in Ukraine. Nothing about human rights or whatever. No, and other countries as well. Territorial integrity. Everybody is talking about territorial integrity. And Azerbaijan, 30 years, they always claimed, oh, our territorial integrity, territorial integrity. Now they have it. Now it is our time to raise this issue. It is now Armenian's territorial integrity is at stake. So we need to raise this issue first of all. Second of all, we have another leverage we can raise in U.S. because U.S., I know, they say follow the money, no, our interests, leverage, no. The new Silk Road that we are talking about, that Zengazur Corridor, is new Silk Road, which is going to bypass Iran. That is why Iran doesn't, is opposing to this Zengazur Corridor. And it is going to be an authoritarian Silk Road. Turkey is authoritarian. Azerbaijan is authoritarian, totalitarian. Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan is authoritarian, and China is authoritarian. The only 
democracy or a kind of a democracy is Armenia, and which is going to shine more. We can really explain this to the Western states. Why are we letting all the authoritarian regimes to pass through a democratic regime? And it is going to be a huge, huge all the way, a totalitarian silk road. Is it in US favor? US is trying to surround Russia, that they are doing, and using a proxy war in Ukraine, with Ukraine. And they are just endorsing Israel. And in, uh, as you know, they are trying to surround China as well, you, and with, with the ta Taiwan conflict. So if they don't, they don't want to be, uh, they don't, they want to weaken Iran, that is the fact, but they want to weaken China as well. So if we, we can have some kind of a democracy on this road, it will be in the interest of the Western countries. That is how we can sell this to US. That is what I think. I don't want to really talk like this, but in this dear world, human rights doesn't matter. That is what I saw. Only interests matter. So we need to stick on territorial integrity, stand up for it. And we have nothing more to compromise. We, we can show it. So nobody can, uh, uh, let's say, blame somebody for treason. So we have nothing to compromise at the table. We are cornered. So we can unite now at the territorial integrity of Armenia because it is our heart. As you know, somebody can break your arm, break your legs, but if your heart beats, that heart can heal the body. But if the heart stops, I fear that you know, it's not like you know, 100 years ago, the first generation really fought about this struggle. Second generation did as well. Third did the same thing. But without Armenia, it would be so hard for our nation all over the world to continue their identity. So we need to stick on these issues and stand up together. Together, really, believe me, we can uh, avoid this coming threat. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we had a question here. Uh, thank you for coming uh, here, Karo. I'm proud of you as the leader. Thank you. That you have done a lot and uh, that I'm proud and stand behind you. And I admire your braveness in the Turkish parliament that I've seen. And, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the question I have is, is, is not a question. Anyway, I don't expect that you be able to answer that question, but I'm sure you're going to try. The situation is so difficult for the, and all of us know that we are in a very bad situation as Armenian. Uh, I think this is the darkest moment when I go back to the history 200, whatever it is, but now is one of the worst uh, period that we are going through. Mm, I don't have any specific question. I was going to ask you about the Iran Armenia situation or relation, Iran as a government or a country is very important for Armenia. Unfortunately, Armenian government, I don't want to blame, but I know they are traitors, but we have been hurt from inside more than Russian, Turkey, or whoever else. Armenians, especially in Armenia, these 40 years or 35 years, Russia knew what they do they put government in Armenia that they destroy from inside. And now we are in a situation. Uh, we have more damage from inside than outside because now the situation in Yerevan is so chaotic and the government in Armenia does not block any action from anywhere. For example, I'm listening to Iranian media and the generals, they are talking about Armenia. They say, we have no dialogue with Pashinyan regime because they don't want to listen to us. We don't know what they are thinking because Iran is very afraid of losing that corridor, uh, the contact with the, uh, the European world from the Iranian, Armenian, Georgia. But 
The Armenian government doesn't want to do anything about that part. Okay, let's, this makes everything difficult and uh, I'm sure you know much, much better than what I do. I have not been in Armenia for years, but uh, the, the, the issue is so complex and so much problems that when you say uniting, I'm, I, that's my wish, okay? And any, everybody's here, the same thing, thinking the same way because they shouldn't be here otherwise. But um, let's talk about Iran-Armenia part okay. to make it easy for you, okay? okay. Uh, because uh, I know it's very I'm impossible to, uh, situation uh, for you. It. No. Thank you. Um, as you know, Iran is perceived, is not very well perceived in the Western countries, as you know. And I don't think we can rely on Iran as well. Because look at what happened in Israel is going to have huge impacts, and we can see a huge uh, large scale of a war in the region in the coming months, even weeks. Anytime Hezbollah can interfere, and anytime your country's Marines are there can bo start to bomb Iran. Do you think when a right, lar large scale war just erupts, will Iran care about Armenia at all? Can we rely on them? No, I don't think so. And being allies with Iran, what would the impact in DC will be, in the Western countries will be? We have to think all about those issues as well. We can't rely on any country in the region. Those are terrible regimes, believe me. Iran, Turkey, you know, um, uh, Azerbaijan. Yeah, some kind of a totalitarian, authoritarian, or th this and that regimes. All over the re region, I mean. Because, no, only 10 years ago, we had hopes about Turkey. Because Turkey is and was a key country. If we could turn Turkey into a democratic state, Let's say it is going to be beneficial to Armenia and all the region. That is why I struggled there. Some of you could have asked me, why did you struggle, Garo? It is a, no, I struggled with my Turkish and Kurdish friends to make Turkey as a democratic country. And only a democratic country can have good relations with Armenia and can recognize the Armenian genocide. That is what I believed. But unfortunately, it is a lost case now. And Iran as well is a roast case. Look at Russia. Look at Azerbaijan. So we can't rely on any country. We can only re rely on our people, first of all. That is why unity is needed. Don't forget. You can, you can hate Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden here. But you know that two years later, you can choose somebody else. It is all the same in Armenia. You can like this prime minister or hate this prime minister. Doesn't matter. It, he is a democratically elected prime minister. We, if we don't like him, if Armenian people, I'm not an Armenian citizen, don't like him, he, they can change him in two years later. But if we become the prisoners of our resentments to this prime minister or that prime minister, we are going to lose Armenia. It is not about this prime minister, that prime minister. I don't care about it. I care about Armenia. All of us need to care about Armenia. If we lose Armenia, that we know, we will not see any election at all. It is going to be the Belarus of South Caucasus, which will never ever have democratic elections. Aliyev has elections. He has 89% of the votes. Belarus has those elections as well. This is really great that we have those elections, that we can change who is going to rule our country. So we need to focus on it. And this policy is not a wrong policy to diversify our, you know, uh, because we are so much dependent on Russia. So, Pursuing peace with Azerbaijan and Turkey is not a right, wrong policy, because we need time. Azerbaijan waited 28 years to take the revenge, because they knew that they were vulnerable and signed a peace deal with Armenia, because they knew that they, 
with capitulations, of course. They knew that they were weak. When you are weak, you just recognize it to get stronger. We need some time to get stronger. If we get, can get stronger, we can just defend our rights, defend the rights of the Arsaf people. That is what we need to focus on. Thank you. Uh, let's see, the gentleman in red and then the one in the back. After that, thanks so much for coming. Um, just a quick question or two questions. You said that in 2016, when you went to Armenia, you know the reception was they didn't want to listen to you, right? So, what was your impression now? Does the current government or you know the people that you spoke to were they more open to the changing? You know that changing world, the, the danger that's coming. And what's your grade on um, Armenian uh, diplomacy? Because just during the last couple of years, there has been so many more diplomatic missions and you know meetings that I see that I haven't seen in like 10 years or 20 years. So what, how do you grade the uh, diplomacy. I know it takes you know decades to build, but uh, how, what what grade do you give to the Armenian diplomacy now? Um, yeah, you know, if you leave, I'm a politician. If you leave everything to politicians, they make mistakes. You shouldn't trust any politician at all. Oh, he should trust about me. Garo should decide. Nigol should decide. Maral should decide. No. We need to have each and every Armenian on board in this struggle. We need to be on the same page. No, I told about so many vulnerabilities. To get over it, we need everybody on board and we need everybody on the same page, which is never again. Never again. We will not let our nation to live another catastrophe. This should be our sentence, first of all. Our diplomacy, our government, civil society, and each and every Armenian needs to be on board. That is what we should do. You know what? I believe in the coming years, if we can avoid this uh, coming threat, Armenia is going to be a more democratic country. Because there is free press there, let's say, some kind of a free press, of course, not fully. Judiciary is going well, better. And um, I believe if we can establish uh, peace, Armenian's economy is going to boom. Uh, in 10 years, we can triple the Armenian economy. And it is going to create tax. As you know, with tax, but United, your taxes, where does, do they go? Half of them goes to security, your army. And Armenia has the greatest army in the world. And nobody can dare to attack America, United States, I guess. So that is what we need to do. With a strong economy, create a strong Armenian economy, which is going to make Armenia be able to defend itself, first of all. And create, build leverages. That is what we should do. So, as you said, it takes decades for it, but we don't have decades. Maybe weeks later, months later, if they continue to see us vulnerable, they are going to attack for sure. I was sure that in 2016, 17, when I was warming, in two to three years, they were going to attack. I was sure even last year, now they were going to attack to Arsah again, but I tried to convince my people, Arsah people, to minimize their demands. But no, they were not there. Any kind of compromise is a treason. Our people can call me traitor. No, what is treason, you know? To make your people suffer is a treason. If you see the threat and don't do anything about it, this is a treason. So we should really think about it to not make our people live another catastrophe. Thank you. I think there was someone in the back with a black, yeah. Uh, 
Misha, if you could go to him, and then Anush, did you have a question? There? So you'll be after. Um, thank you for coming to UCLA, Mr. Pylon. Uh, I'm also a student here at UCLA, and my question is, what are some steps we can take here in the diaspora to prevent another catastrophe in Armenia? Um, I need to repeat myself, I guess, but I need to find another point. You know, uh, a healthy relationship, I don't know what your profession is, but whatever your profession is, doesn't matter. We are an Armenian. We need to, when you go home, just think about it. You have relatives, you have friends, first of all. What you can do is call them. Armenia is at stake. We need to do something to help Armenia. Raise awareness about it. Not only in California, please. Not only in California, because your Congress people are in favor of Armenia. They say concerns, deep concerns, senators are like that. But when they go to DC, what they do? Follow them. Do they uh, just offer, a, let's say, but, but I don't know, law or whatever, what they do about in DC? Do they put pressure on Biden administration to act? Follow that. In other states, you have relatives, call them to put pressure on their Congress people, senators, to put pressure on Biden. Only one telephone call we need to say Aliyev and Erdogan, don't do it. That is enough. Or else I am going to hurt you. Hurting means, it is not going to mean militarily, of course. As you know, United States cannot send troops to Armenia, which is not good because Russia is going to be unhappy with it and hurt Armenia as well. What happened was that when US troops were there, just a little troop, 80 person, somebody had exercise. Russians have started the operation to Arsat those days to give that signal. Hurting means sanctions. Really, Azeri's love, Aliyev loves money. They have, he has tens of billions of dollars in the US banks, you know. So they will care the money, of course, if they see uh, coming sanctions. That is how we can help. If we can raise this awareness and put uh, pressure on your Congress people and senators all over the United States, and it is going to turn into a pressure on the Biden administration to act. That is how we can stop. That is why I am here, guys. I could have, I could have been in Yerevan. I was there more. But I knew, knew, know that we cannot stop them from just there. United States needs to act. European Union needs to act to show Aliyev a red line to not attack on Armenia and sit to the table, which we are so close, sign the peace deal, which is going to guarantee the territorial integrity of Armenia. We will buy some time, five to 10 years, and be a functioning state, which is going to buy their self without any allies defending our country. You know, Israel has an iron dome. We can create an iron dome, we can have the, those weapons with a functioning economy to defend our nation. No more humiliation, we should say. Our nation is, has been humiliating. We do not deserve this. No more humiliation, we should say. No more humiliation. I am against weapons. I don't want my tax, my people's money to go for it. I was always against it. Look at my position. Because you know, if you, you speak with somebody, convince somebody, and don't do it, why don't we make peace? If they come with a weapon, hit you, they end you. No, it is how it is. This world is ruled by force. So we need to be powerful, and it comes by leverages and allies who are going to help you. So we need to build them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Anush Suni. I'm a postdoc here in the Promise Armenian Institute. This was a wonderful presentation. I appreciate how you 
laid out the relationship between the diaspora and the Republic of Armenia in this issue. I'd like to hear you speak about your home community, the Armenian community in Turkey and Istanbul, as well as the Kurdish community in Turkey and how those communities play into this puzzle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Armenians, uh, only 40,000, about 40,000 Armenians left in Turkey who are Christians, who, are, who call themselves Armenians. Because we have Muslim, Muslimized Armenians, as you know, hundreds of thousands of them, but uh, only 40,000 Armenians we have. And we have been silent for eight years, as you know. My grandparents, like all your grandparents, or our fathers and mothers, always recommended us to be silent. They were silent because even they hide their names. But no, there was a window of opportunity with European Union process. And that thought came from US, do you know it? Because US thought, oh, we should have a role model in the Muslim world, which can be Turkey. Let's offer this to Europe. Europe, you should start the European Union process with Turkey to make Turkey as a democratic country, which can be a role model to the Muslim world. It would be really great if US continued to that vision. And unfortunately, Sarkozy and Merkel show the cold shoulder to Turkey, and Turkey left the democratic path. And because of the power struggle between Gülenist and Erdogan, and it, it was the end of uh, that dream, unfortunately. Now Turkey is a lost case. And for 20 years, we could speak. We could have our demands outspoken, and even commemorate the Armenian genocide on the Taksim Square, which is the main square of Istanbul. Speak about it, talk about it, ask about it. But unfortunately, Turkey is even now worse than before, unfortunately. So our nation is silent again. We have people there, 40,000 people, but they are silent. But the new generation, they don't want to be silent. Some of them, whoever have chance, want to leave country. That is our situation. And Kurds are repressed as well, as you know. There are 20, 25 million Kurds are living in Turkey. They are repressed. Their rights are not recognized. There is a huge hypocrisy in the world, but maybe the worst hypocrites are in Turkey. They are in favor of Palestinian rights. They are just blaming Israel. Why are you bombing Palestinians in Gaza? And they are doing the same thing against Kurds. In, even in Syria, not only in Turkey. In Syria, Kurds are trying to establish a diverse safe haven with Armenians, Assyrians, Arabs together, which, which has really gender equality, ecological you know, values, so many values that the Western people will like. But they have been bombed every day, and the world is turning a blind eye on them, and Turkey is one, on the one side supporting the Palestinian uh, cause, on the other side bombing the uh, uh, Kurdish people, unfortunately. So everybody is vulnerable. Who asks for their rights? So this establishment is uh, stronger than ever, unfortunately. That cruel establishment is stronger than ever. So uh, we are vulnerable. And I don't think this is going to change soon. That is why I quit you know, uh, active politics in Turkey, because I think it's a lost case for the short term or the mid term. I, I'm going to play a nonpartisan role and try to help Armenia. Of course, this requires good relations with Turkey and Azerbaijan as well. We can't do this. Oh, those are authoritarian regimes. We have nothing to do with it. No. That geography is the, our destiny, Armenia's destiny. We can't take Armenia out of that geography to put uh, somewhere else. Our neighbors is go are going to be autocratic regimes in the coming decades, not only years, unfortunately. So we need to really have good relations with Turkey, with Azerbaijan. There is a corridor, as you know, let's say. I want to talk about it as well. So if we can really, but we don't think about that corridor, let's say so-called corridor, whatever. We can make, prepare the 
all the projects of that corridor from north to south, Iran to Russia, Georgia, from Azerbaijan to Turkey, which is going to benefit everyone. We should convince U.S. firms for this. This is going to benefit everyone in the region. So this is how I guess we can really convince people about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? I think we have one right here, Emily. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pilon. Um, my question relates to the United States leverage against Turkey. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of years um, the United States struggle to apply that leverage. For example, in 2019, we saw, as you mentioned earlier, um, Turkey launch Operation Peace Spring in, against the SDF forces in Syria, um, against the opposition of the United States. We've recently seen the United States shoot down a Turkish drone after multiple calls for the drone to be removed because of U.S. Uh, forces being nearby and that uh, call being not heeded. Are we seeing a waning of U.S. leverage against Turkey? What is your perception of that? And if not, where are those leverages that can be used in this, um, um, in, the, in this case, in this scenario uh, for, for Armenia and for Artsakh? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Turkish politics uh, were always paranoid, you know. Uh, first of all, against communism, let's say, because they, uh, the Western powers just were consolidated against communism, whatever, Russia, and Turkey have built all the U.S. You know, bases, as you know, for decades. But when the Soviet empire collapsed, Turkey have started to play the balance policy, which were beneficiary for Turkey when it was established. Really, Atatürk played this game very well now in the 20s and 30s and during the you know, uh, independence war of Turkey, they, they call it like that. So, uh, Tayyip Erdogan is playing the same game, the balance policy, and benefiting from that. And showing U.S. as a uh, threat to the Turkish people. Turkish people, let's say 70 to 80 percent of them are biased to Armenia. Uh, United States, I'm sorry. And they are showing that, you no, know, there is a saying in Turkish, nobody is friends with us. We need to unite. And they just centralize their power and they show, show those bases, U.S. bases in Syria as a threat to Turkey. And U.S. bases in uh, agency is a threat to Turkey. And over this, they just centra uh, con uh, centralize uh, and consolidate, consolidate the uh, uh, vote to the nationalist parties, unfortunately. So these vicious circles help the nationalism, unfortunately. When you down a Turkish drone, it fuels Turkish nationalism. But, you know, they, they just uh, are there because of their, they don't, they, they like, it's not, the, the reason is not they like Kurds, as you know, U.S. is there because of their interests, just because they want, they don't want the Shia corridor to be there and they, they want to surround uh, Iran. And, but, you know, we were blamed that uh, before the genocide, you were allies with Russia, you, you had your friends with uh, France, whatever. And this was an excuse to commit the genocide, as you know. Now they are doing the same things against the Kurds. They are just repressing Kurds, bombing every day. When they become with allies with the United States in northern Syria, oh, look, they are, they are with the United States. So they dehumanize them as well, and continue to bomb them and show this to the Turkish uh, people as an excuse. This is, uh, no, the, the, with this game, only Turkish nationalism is going to win, unfortunately. And Turkey is surrounded by Russia, Russia and United States, and th this, this is, uh, unfortunately, is fueling the Turkish nationalism. We need to somehow end this, but I don't see how, unfortunately, I don't have an answer. Because as I said, we all have entered the dark era. 
All the big powers are there, Russians, United States, and China have interests in the Middle East, as you know. And all the people are going to suffer in that region. Nobody is going to be safe in that region, unfortunately. And the nations who don't have the capacity to defend itself is going to be vulnerable. And I've, I know that one day United States is going to leave Syria and Kurds in Syria will be more vulnerable as well. I'm sorry about this, but this is a dark era. I don't have an answer how to secure everybody. We have to now, now as an Armenian, that is what I'm saying. Um, first, save Armenia, then everybody, of course. We need that kind of a safe heaven as a democratic state, which, has, which is recognized by the UN. First, we need to save this, I guess. Thank you. I think maybe this, oh, well, sorry. Uh, this young lady has not asked a question yet, and then we'll go to you. Hello, I am asking a question on behalf of my dad who is watching from home and is very grateful that you're here tonight speaking to us. Um, I just wanted to preface by saying that I am obviously in complete agreement about unity on all fronts and in this time, the diaspora and you know the people in Armenia, we need to put everything aside and come together. Um, there is like, a few elements that I feel like sometimes make it hard for that unity and I just wanted to address one of them so I can you know do a better job convincing others later and that is you know the talk of corruption there and how leaders there I'm just the talk of it I'm not claiming to any certain uh, leader you know they're they've become millionaires or they're pocketing the money and and so my dad said the whole point of my question is if if the leadership or president of Armenia is really, um, do they really care about the welfare of Ar Armenia and they're not there for personal gains? And I'm just asking it again so that we can kind of do a better job addressing it as a community because I do hear it come up a lot. You know, uh, everywhere, you know, I don't, I don't know any country where there is not you know, corruption. But if there is rule of law, if you have civil society, and if you have active media, journalists who dig that, that, that corruption, you can, you, can, uh, the, you can make the ones who do the corruption pay the price of it. That is how we should go, you know? In Turkey, ooh, there is a huge corruption. In Azerbaijan, in other countries, you can't believe. Because media is not functioning, judiciary is not functioning, parliament is not functioning, and of course, in these, under these circumstances, corruption is easy, very easy to do. But in Armenia, on the contrary, rule of law is getting better. Media is functioning, and there is a civil society, and the new generation cares about these issues. The moral values are better. That is why I believe the corruption is every year getting less and less in Armenia. That's the good news. That's the good news. In, even in the United States, I hear so many accusations about corruptions lately. But media finds it out sometimes, and, and judiciary sentences them. That is how you can get rid of uh, corruption, and that is what Armenia is trying to do. And we need to help them as, for that as well. Thank you. Can you help us identify specific um, vulnerabilities in the Turkish-Azerbaijan strategic relationships that can be, can you identify and elaborate on them? Turkish-Azerbaijan relationship vulnerability. Right, and as targets for exploitation. I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. The, Every relationship has its faults. Yeah, Turkish-Azerbaijan relationship, you mean? Between okay. the Azerbaijan and um, Turkish relationship, okay. strategically, okay. are there any vulnerabilities? Yes, I, I got it now. Fault lines okay. that a third, no. third party can... Okay, 
I got it. I got your question. Yeah, unfortunately, Turkey is economy is not doing well. As you know, autocratic regimes are not doing well, and that is why Erdogan is more dependent on the money coming from the authoritarian regimes, and Azerbaijan is pouring money to Turkey. And that is why they have more leverage. They have a payroll in the Turkish media, you can't believe. They brainwash all the Turkish people against Armenians. And um, let's say Azerbaijans are uh, investing in Turkey, in economically they have leverage. But, and uh, Turkey doesn't have a salt Caucasus policy, unfortunately. They don't have it. They claim that they are a great power, but they don't have a policy. Azerbaijan is decide their you know, uh, salt Caucasus policy. This is a vulnerability. Some uh, and very important uh, ruling party members are not happy with it. This is not going to, this is not in our favor. We shouldn't behave like this. We had a great power. We should have had a, a policy, salt Caucasus policy, and make peace in salt Caucasus, and it's going to be beneficial for Turkey as well. Especially the Turk Armenian border cities, members of the parliament are so unhappy with it because they know if they can, we can establish peace, open the borders, th those border cities will be benefiting from this peace. They know it. And that is, what, that is a vulnerability. And uh, we need to, we need to, that is what, how maybe that is another issue that I, I'm trying to convince them that you need to have a uh, free Caucasus policy which is going to uh, establish peace and deliver welfare of three nations, including the Turkish people as well. But Azerbaijanis are not there. I guess in this policy, Russians are the uh, big finger in this uh, no, no peace policy. That is what we need to change, but that, that's a vulnerability, I can say. Turkey has no South Caucasus policy. Okay, uh, let's see, maybe this young man, I think he hasn't asked a question yet. Garuber, yakşamlar. Yakşamlar. So I'm from France, I'm from Europe. Uh, my dad's from Istanbul. And um, I just wanted to introduce the European point of view to have your opinion about it. So, um, in terms of Europe, I think that France is the most uh, interesting country to focus on because it's the most influential in terms of the Armenian, uh, Armenian uh, subject. Uh, the problem in France is that um, you were mentioning the, um, reaching out for the congressmen, reaching out for uh, maybe European congressmen, the members of uh, Congress that go to Brussels. Uh, many French people and Armenian people did that. Uh, every week, every month, there are uh, many French uh, congressmen that always open the subject in front of uh, Ursula von der Leyen. But despite all these um, complaints, despite all the facts that are uh, pointed out, there is no efforts, there is nothing. The only true uh, moment when the Armenian voice is um, listened to in Europe is, uh, as you said, it's a very good leverage, is during election times. When the, for example, in France, there is the presidential election, there is always a big law about the Armenian uh, problem that's vote. For example, the recognition of the Armenian genocide was maybe one year before the presidential election. So now that's the only true leverage uh, Armenian, the Armenian community has in France. Do you see other, maybe, uh, large-scale leverage like that? Um, unfortunately, I don't see that leverage because just like we are doing the same here in US, French uh, Armenians uh, are remembered, as you said, a year before the elections. And um, not for, for the future of Armenia, let's say, about the genocide uh, mostly, 
uh, that they offer a resolution and uh, that is how we are happy with. I think we need to uh, use this leverage to save Armenia and to focus on Armenian future more in U Europe as well. That is what I can recommend to European Armenians. And second of all, now we are sometimes think you now some senators, some Congress people in our region raises this issue in the parliament will mean something. I was a parliamentarian. I gave several speeches, as you know. In the parliament, people speak, and you think oh, it is something. No. If it doesn't turn into a resolution, which is going to be ratified in the parliament and put pressure on administration, it means something. Speaking about means raising an issue doesn't mean anything at all. Doesn't mean anything at all. As an eight-year no, I just have been in the parliament. I can tell you about it. So what means is this? You know, what matters is this about the Armenian cause, a coming threat? If European Union tells Azerbaijan, if you attack Armenia, I'm just going to, just going to end this energy deal in a day. If they say so, Azerbaijan won't attack. Even if they give this fear to Azerbaijan, they are not going to attack, I'm sure about it. But without US pressure on European Union to do so, they are not going to do it, unfortunately. Because they say, we need to buy natural gas from somewhere. We sanctioned Russia. OK, you don't like Arabs or we don't have pipeline from them. The only way we have pipeline, pipeline is the Azeris. So they are buying it from them and laundering the Russian oil. We need to raise this issue. I think if, even if Azerbaijan attacks, which he, they wouldn't, but even if they attack, US can compensate that one to 2% consumption so easily, I'm sure about it. US can really offer this to Europe if you, show this stick, if they do it, which we, I don't think they are going to do it, if the United States can compensate that 2% something for a year, then they are not going to attack. So th this is what we should do. We should change this sentence. Bi Biden administration don't want to hurt Azerbaijan sentence. Biden administration will, will, hurt Azerbaijan if they attack Armenia. If they use that sentence, they are not going to attack at all. Showing the stick is enough. They are not showing the stick even for us. We should face this. And, but if with our unity and effort, I am sure we can convince them to show the stick. It is enough. Thank you. I think uh, maybe one question here, and then I'm going to make a comment based on the Zoom questions, too. Okay. No, please, go ahead. This. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ani. I'm an attorney in uh, California, um, retired attorney, becoming a therapist. But um, I'm a representative also of the Helsinki Association of Human Rights in Armenia. And I've been working with them for the last seven years, uh, Nina Garapetians and Araik Papikian. Um, I was in Armenia just a couple of weeks ago uh, at a legal conference that they organized. And uh, they are making many efforts towards uh, democracy uh, in the country. Um, I just uh, participated in the conference where they had invited the ambassadors of all the nations to come, and many of them did come. And they showed the, uh, there was a research study that they conducted of the courts in Armenia. And so uh, I don't need to summarize all of the, the conclusions that they came to, but I, I have seen with my own eyes and living in Armenia many months and a few years at this point, the last seven years, that it's true that there is a progress being made towards a democratic Armenia. Um, my question to you is, uh, when I'm in the diaspora, what is your opinion about the annual genocide marches here? How much energy should 
the Armenian diaspora put into marching every year? Or is there something more um, productive that we can do um, instead of, because I feel what you said about we look to the past. I think those marches, uh, and Stepan Partamian is another person who has this criticism of those marches, uh, they seem to be very uh, focused on the past. Um, so I want to hear what your opinion is about uh, the energy that the diaspora puts into every year being Armenian, representing Armenia in California and the United States. How can, is that a good uh, thing to continue to do every year or is there something better we can do? Thank you. No, to God, no, we shall never forget our ancestors, of course. I, I never forget them, as you know. And uh, none of us forget them, their sufferings. But I'm sure, you know, if my grandparents, uh, grandmother Siranush were here, she would have told me, because she was a very courageous woman, Garo, go help Armenia, forget about me. Go help Armenia, save your future, first of all. If you don't save your future, you will not be able to find peace in the uh, past. Because getting stuck in the past, you no, know, destroys your future. This doesn't mean we can do to both together. But without future, you will not, we will never ever find peace in the past. But look, what 108 years passed. We've marched all these 108 years. Did Turkey pay the price of the genocide? No, not at all. And do you think in the coming years, if we go on like this, Azerbaijan will the price of the genocide that they just committed against our South people? No, not at all. Because the world have entered a dark era. We marched during a better era. The world have entered a very dark era now. And the finding peace, finding justice will be harder in the coming decades. I'm sure about it. If you don't have leverage, you will not be able to find peace justice in this world before a judge, wherever it is. Looks, we sometimes think we are the only nation suffered, suffered genocide. No, SEDs suffered how many genocides, you know? 14 genocides, SEDs. The last one was only nine years ago. 18 genocides, 14 genocides they suffered. Do anybody care about them? No. And moreover, they don't have a state to support their position. We have a state. So, yeah, even if, you, if some of you only care about genocide, what I recommend to them is that to really find justice about genocide, you need to focus on a strong Armenia. Because only with a strong Armenia, with a strong diaspora, with a strong youth, which creates a strong economy, a strong uh, diplomacy, strong politicians can uh, defend your cause about the Armenian genocide as well. So we put 90% of our energy in the past. We always did like this. Now what I recommend is for some years, Let's put 90% of our energy to the future, which is go going to benefit if we can create a strong Armenia, strong nation, strong di diaspora, strong economy, strong diplomacy, is going to make our cause stronger about the Armenian genocide as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have had a number of questions on Zoom, but I think almost all of them have been asked by our audience here. Many of them, though, do pertain to this notion of unity, and maybe this will be the last question, unity, compromise, which is so hard. And you're probably aware in the United States, our Congress doesn't have a Speaker of the House because the word compromise is so offensive to so many people. And yet, I think what you are saying, and perhaps you can elaborate, is that 
at this point in Armenian history, we are at practically an existential crisis if yeah. we have not entered it already. And yeah. this is where all of the differences that may exist, and many of them may be important, should fall away in favor of moving forward in unity. Maybe you could just kind of end with this. Okay. Kind of you know what? In Turkey, I hated that word, unity, oh. because that unity word was always used against us. <laughs> and ironically, I'm using that word now. But, you know, Turkey is a diverse country. Let's say there are Turks, Kurds, Armenians, Assyrians, Alevis, and so many identities, so many religions are living in Turkey. But we, as Armenian nation, we are, we might be communist, we might be socialist, we might be nationalist, left wing, right wing, doesn't matter. Now, let's forget about these resentments between each other. Let's forget about this. We all are Armenians. We suffered enough. That should be our sentence. We suffered enough. And this should be our last suffering. Let's focus on it and unite to avoid the coming threat. Believe me, if we can avoid this coming threat, it's going to be a success story. That Armenia is going to be a success story. I believe in the young generation. Look at here, so many young people here. I see. I believe, believe in them. The first generation, second generation, third generation did try to do their best. But I believe in the coming generation. They are going to create a strong Armenia, which is going to defend itself. A strong diplomacy, strong politicians, strong lawyers, engineers. And all of them are going to create a strong Armenia, which we will be proud of. We need to focus on it. And please think about how we can make the diaspora and Armenian relations healthy. Please, tonight, think about it. And try to go to Armenia to contribute, to help them, to understand their reality and make this relation healthy. This is a very unhealthy relationship. And give it a break to blame each other. This is the, this is, we like very much. No, with blaming somebody, you are just leaving that responsibility. Don't forget about it. Just blaming a prime minister, this politician, that party, that ideology, whatever. With blaming somebody, you think you, are, you, are, you just did your responsibility. No, you did not. Tonight, let's think about it and how we can take this responsibility together. If we take this responsibility together, first we are going to avoid the coming threat and make Armenia great together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. What a treat to have you here. Such a blessing to have you. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. this opportunity. Oh, this was so special. And I will mention that Mr. Pylon will be around after the event at our reception. So please uh, feel free to chat with him there. Let me thank you all once again for being here, those of you on Zoom, those of you on YouTube, and those of you here in person. Let me just mention that we also do have a few events coming up for the Promise Armenian Institute. In fact, one will be here in this room on November 1 at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We will be hosting the world premiere of a recently discovered lost film entitled Jackie in the Near East from 1924, a short film that was produced by the Near East Relief featuring Jackie Coogan as a mechanism for raising funds for Armenian genocide survivors. Uh, and then we will have a couple of um, uh, book talks, one by uh, Professor Elise Samerjan of Clark University on Wednesday, November 15 at 10 a.m. Pacific, and one by our own Professor Sebu Aslanian of our uh, History Department at UCLA on November 28 at 6 p.m. Pacific. So 
Thank you all once again. I'd like to offer special thanks to our staff, our deputy director, Hasmik Bagdasarian, Emily Pagosian, Nanor. Uh, thank you to Misha Hall, who is running around with the microphone. And again, thank you all for being here. We invite you to join us for our reception. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.